I wonder if you can guess who this is. <laughs> I didn't always look like this kind of crazy, middle-aged, red-headed woman. I actually looked quite normal once. Um, someone asked me a while ago, when did I first know that I was a geek? And I'm a professor of computer science, so I must be a geek, right? And I thought back to this kind of time when I used to save up my pocket money every week, and then about once a month, we'd go to the local shopping centre. I'd run straight, straight into WH Smith's and straight over to the maths textbook section so that I could buy myself a maths textbook. So did anyone else here do that? <laughs> well, no one. <laughs> So this is me about um, when I was about 13 or 14. So unfortunately, about a year before this photo was taken, my mum died really suddenly. She was 34 at the time, I was 12, and my brother and sister were six or seven. And she had a headache one day, went to bed, and went off to hospital that night in an ambulance. And then a couple of days later, we had to turn off the life support machine. So obviously, a massive trauma. So then, for the year after that, about a year after that, my uh, dad got remarried, so possibly too quickly and possibly to the wrong person, just a personal opinion. And, <laughs> and my life went from living in a functional family to a dysfunctional family. So from about the ages of 13 to 16, I was quite depressed as a teenager. There was quite a lot of emotional cruelty, uh, bullying, some physical, so obviously that was terrible. Uh, when I was 16, I was just desperate to leave home. I worked in a cafe down the road, and as I was walking to work with my uh, friend down to the cafe where we worked as waitresses, I, I just kind of like poured my heart out to my friend Kate and said, I've got, I've got to leave home, and I don't know what I'll do if I can't get out of that place. And she said, why don't I ask my mum if you can come and live with us? So she asked her mum, and luckily... Uh, her mum said yes, and so the next week I took all my stuff, packed all my stuff up into uh, black bags and took it round to Kate's house and started kind of a new life really, living at Kate's house, which was wonderful. I finally had enough food to eat, um, I put on a stone in about a month and um, I remember Kate's mum asking me what I thought about living with them and I said I feel like I'm on a permanent holiday, it was just so amazing. So I lived there with Kate and her family for about a year, from 16 to 17. I tried to stay on at school, but it was quite difficult. Kate's family didn't have loads of money, and I needed to, to work to be able to pay a small amount of rent to them. Um, so I was working as a waitress in a cafe uh, during the week after school, and then at the weekends to make enough money. And what I found was that I, I stayed on at school to do my A-levels, but then actually I kept falling asleep at school and I realised actually I wasn't going to pass my A-levels. So I thought, OK, I'll just leave and get a job. So I left and uh, got a job working for the local council and then decided when I was 17 I wanted to move to London. I was out in Essex at the time. So we moved to London. Sorry, I moved to London and uh, worked in various roles, including um, student nurse, working with refugees, and uh, working for a record company. And then when I was 20, my uh, boyfriend proposed to me. So we got married when I was 20 and uh, had my first daughter when I was 21. And here I am about two years later uh, with three children under two and a half, uh, <laughs> which if anyone here has experienced that, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually did enjoy it. Um, I really loved having little kids, and, uh, and a, lot, a lot of life was great then, but unfortunately, about a year after this photo was taken, um, my marriage broke down, my ex-husband started becoming violent, and he, he had threatened to kill me, which for some reason I hadn't really taken seriously. Um, but on one particular morning, he threatened to kill the kids as well, and I thought, okay, that's it, we're out of here. So I packed a suitcase, and ran down the road with my daughter and my twins in the twin buggy. My three-year-old daughter running along beside me. We ran down the road, got to my friend's house, called uh, Women's Aid, and then by that night we were in a women's refuge on the other side of London. So we were in the refuge for six months, and then we managed to get a council flat, so somewhere to live in Brixton in South London. And I got settled in the flat, and then uh, I thought, well, I need, to, I need to get a job. We're settled now. You know, I didn't think I'd be a single parent, but here I am. I'm a single parent. I need to get a job. But when I looked at what sort of jobs I could get, I wouldn't actually be able to earn enough money 
to be able to pay for childcare for the kids. So I realised I, I couldn't go back to work. So I thought, well, I didn't want to leave education in the first place. Why don't I go back into education? So I really love maths, as I said earlier. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll just try and do like maths A level. I went along to the local college, and luckily they had a course which enabled me to do two maths A levels in one year, um, which was amazing. So I did that. I remember walking into the first class. Back then I had massive bushy dyed black hair. Um, and, uh, and I was wearing like a biker jacket, a miniskirt and DMs. And I walked into this classroom and uh, it was nearly all men in suits. And I, <laughs> and I was just so scared. I thought, oh goodness, what am I doing? But actually, um, I saw a woman who looked friendly at the back of the class. So I went and sat next to her. And uh, at the end of the year, um, me and Lorna, my friend, came top of the class. Uh, so it all worked out quite well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that meant I could apply for university. I applied to go to South Bank Uni, which was the local uni, and I thought, should I study maths or I could also do computer science? And I thought, technology is where the money is, uh, so, so and I need to feed my children. So I decided to sign up for a degree in computer science. And here's my graduation. Um, so four years of a degree. First year was really hard because I had to take the kids to school, then go to uni, then leave uni early to go and pick them up. But um, I absolutely loved it. Um, not every day, but in general. And uh, managed to graduate with a 2-1 after four years. In the final year of my degree, my project supervisor said to me, what do you think about doing a PhD? So I said, oh, I'd love to do a PhD. But what I didn't tell him was, I didn't know what a PhD was. <laughs> but luckily, it was the right thing. So I applied for a PhD position and got that. And here I am, seven years later, uh, getting a PhD in software engineering. And as you can see, the colour of my hair changes uh, in every photo almost. My PhD took seven years. After three years, I applied for a full-time lectureship, which I got. So I became a full-time lecturer and finally had a salary, which was amazing. Then I thought, well, I'll just apply for promotion any time I can. So I applied and became senior lecturer and then a principal lecturer. And then in 2006, I applied for a job as head of department at the University of Westminster and got that. Um, and uh, I've had an academic career ever since. So then in 2018, the head of department of uh, computer science from Durham University gave me a call and asked me if I'd be interested in working at Durham. And uh, I said, yes, I suppose. <laughs> uh, so we had like a year long conversation Then I applied for a job uh, and became professor of computer science at Durham University, which kind of was my dream job. I'd applied for uh, a lectureship at Durham in 2001, I think, and, and didn't get it. So um, yeah, so I was delighted to, to actually be asked to apply. Uh, and that's the role that I'm still in now, seven years later. So. Going back now to, I think this is about uh, year 2000. Um, in 1998, I was still doing my PhD and I was going to academic conferences and trying to network with people. And, um, and I was really shy and not really keen on networking, but my PhD supervisor says, you've got to network when you go to conferences. It's not just what you know, it's who you know. So I was going to academic conferences and trying to network and sometimes that was fine and other times, either got ignored or people were quite rude um, and I didn't have the best time. And then in 1998, I went to uh, a women in science conference and I walked in thinking, oh no, you know, like I hate networking, but I actually had like the best time ever. It was really wonderful. Um, I made loads of friends there, which are still friends today, like 27 years later. And uh, it kind of helped me to realize that now and again, it's really nice to be in a group as a woman in tech with other women in tech. Um, and I came back and set up the UK's first online network for women in tech called BCS Women, which is the British Computer Society Women's Network. And because I was leading that, I got invited up to Bletchley Park for the first time in, I think, 2003. And on the way there, I thought, what do I know about Bletchley Park? I think the code breakers work there, and wasn't it like 50 old blokes wearing tweed jackets? Um, smoking pipes and doing the Times crossword. 
So that's what I knew or knew about it. And so I, I went there for the meeting and that was quite interesting. But then I went for a walk around afterwards and bumped into these guys who were rebuilding Alan Turing's bomb machine. So all of these machines were destroyed during the Second World War. So I started chatting to them about what they were doing and then they said to me, why are you here today? So I said, oh, I, I run this network for women in tech. And uh, they said, well, did you know that more than half the people that worked at Bletchley Park were women? So I said, no, I didn't know that. There was no sign of it around the site. Um, so uh, I went away that day and I thought, well, I've got to do something to raise the profile of the women that worked at Bletchley Park. So I got some funding and we ran an oral history project where we interviewed the women to capture their memories of working at Bletchley Park. At the launch of that project, I found out that Bletchley Park might have to close because they didn't have enough funding. So um, I thought, well, that, that's terrible. Um, and then I got invited to a reception at Bletchley Park. And so uh, for the first time, I kind of went round the site and uh, went into all these amazing code-breaking huts, heard all these stories. We were being taken round by one of the veterans that worked there during World War II. And um, he said that the work that was done there at Bletchley Park was said to have shortened World War II by two years. And at that time, 11 million people a year were dying. So potentially the work that was done there had saved 22 million lives. And I thought, this place can't close. So I basically started a campaign uh, to save it. I managed to get onto BBC News and uh, Radio 4 Today programme and... Uh, with, by then I was head of department, we wrote a letter to the Times saying we've got to save Bletchley Park. And that went into the Times newspaper on the same day. So basically started a campaign. I didn't really know what I was doing, but uh, I gave it a go anyway. But I was so passionate about the cause. That was in July 2008. And a few months later, so like quite a few people emailed me and stuff after I was on BBC News, but nothing really had happened and Bletchley Park hadn't got any more money. So it wasn't until later that year that I started using Twitter. A few months after that, um, I saw this tweet from Stephen Fry, who was uh, stuck in a, a lift in Centre Point in London. And I thought, Stephen Fry, I know he loves history, I know he loves technology. Why don't I try and contact him and see if he'll get involved in the campaign? So that's what I did. Luckily, he was following me on Twitter. And so I got to send him several direct messages. And then the next day, he tweeted this link to my blog that I'd set up. And at that time, I was getting about 50 hits a day on my blog. And one tweet from Stephen Fry, and I got 8,000 hits that day. And I became the most retweeted person in the world uh, on Twitter uh, back in 2009. So that was amazing. Um, I ran the campaign for three years. So it took three years. And then in the end, uh, Bletchley Park got 4.1 million from the Heritage Lottery Fund so that we knew that they'd be OK. After that campaign was over, I started thinking that I really wanted to teach tech skills to mums, particularly mums in disadvantaged areas, because I really realised that technology and education had massively changed my life and my life chances. I now had a successful career uh, and was doing really well, and I thought, I need all mums to know uh, that technology can be good. It doesn't have to be bad. And there was a lot of stuff always in the press of, that was negative about technology. So I put together a programme and called it Tech Mums and started running it in schools in London. And we then uh, expanded and ran in various places around the UK. And it was teaching stuff like app design, web design, social media. And what I found was that we didn't just uh, improve the mums confidence with technology, it actually improved their general self-esteem. And we could see that with the mums coming on the programme, they just became more and more confident as they went through the programme, and just really blossomed, and, um, and that was just uh, an amazing result. So then fast forward to working at Durham University, so a project called uh, Tech Up Women, I think we've got some in the audience, maybe not. <laughs> They promised me they were coming. <laughs> uh, there's a project called Tech Up Women. Um, so when I joined Durham with another professor uh, there and um, other staff at the university, we put together a proposal to apply for funding to run a programme to take women from underserved communities and train them into tech careers. And Tech Up Women was the result. 
So the whole idea is that we work with industry partners, we find out where skill shortages are in technology, and then we create programs and find women with potential to come on the program and train them directly into those job roles. And um, the program's been running now for six years and has been really successful. We've had 600 women almost through the program um, and had some great results, won lots of awards. Um, one of the things, here's some kind of stats about the last three years of um, women that have been through the program. And you can see that 52% of women were unemployed before they joined the program. And then after, 50% uh, have got jobs in technology and 50% almost have gone on to study technology. Um, and you can also see, if you look at the table underneath, that the average salary for the women that were unemployed beforehand was 23,000 after the programme. And it's just 12 weeks long. We also know that we've changed people's lives because we've had women come in on the programme. I can remember one woman at our very first uh, residential meetup who said that she was suicidal, that She'd been trying to get a job for about five years. She had a six-year-old daughter. And um, so she'd left work to have her daughter, but then wasn't able to get back into the workforce. And so, you know, she was kind of at her wit's end, and this course was her last chance. She came on the programme. The first residential, she told some of us that in confidence, and we were really worried about her. Um, and then at the second residential, so like about four or five weeks later... We really focus hard on building, building confidence and support with the women that come on the programme. A few weeks later, she announced to everybody when she arrived that she'd been offered two jobs and uh, she didn't know which one to choose. So we know that we don't just change the women's lives also. We change every, it changes everyone around them. It's not just the women themselves. So that's incredible. And so we know that our programme has worked really well for almost 600 women now. We've only run in the north, or well only, the best place, right? <laughs> but we've only run in the north. What we want to do now is expand across the UK and even globally. And I just really recently went into the Bangladesh High Commission to chat to them because they're in, interested in running tech mums in Bangladesh. So watch this space. So going back to the beginning, I never would have thought that I'd be able to have the life that I have now to be standing on stage in front of hundreds of people. I was like a shy, depressed teenager. When I was living in the refuge, I just thought, is there any hope for me? How on earth am I going to bring up my kids? But by kind of keeping on going and, and doing the things that I really care about, I've, I've managed to change not just my life, but also the people around me. I've now got a lovely husband, four kids, six grandkids, you can see here, and six cats. I forgot to put a photo of the cats in. <laughs> Don't tell them. <laughs> so my life has just changed out of all recognition and it kind of helping so many people um, has really helped me to I think come to terms with some of the abuse and neglect that I suffered and helped me to kind of turn it into something positive positive. and I think you know we only get one life we need to make the most of it and if I can do that so can you thanks